Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 77, September 5th to September 11th, 1862. Last week, we had the Confederate victory at Second Manassas. This week, we're going to set up for Antietam, staying exclusively in the East. In two weeks' time, we're going to catch up on what is happening in Tennessee. I know, oftentimes we say how there is a bias to the Eastern Theater, but I think it will help with the flow if we roll with this one and completely play it out before we head in the other direction. So, let's start off with the Battle of Chantilly. We need to begin by first closing out fully the Northern Virginia Campaign before we move into the first invasion of Maryland and the Battle of Antietam, which, shockingly enough, is actually going to happen next week. So General Pope had massed his men around Centerville with indecision gripping at him. The magnitude of his defeat at Second Manassas had finally set in. Henry Halleck and Washington would order an attack, but he was too worried that the enemy would strike at him with his army still being disorganized. Several of the Union generals would vote that a withdrawal into the defenses around Washington was wise. In the meantime, Lee would send Jackson in an attempt to flank Pope and take that option off the table. Jackson's objective was Germantown, Virginia, a place where the Warrenton and Little River Turnpikes met, these being the two likely options for retreat for the Army of Virginia. If this happened and Jackson was successful, then they could destroy Pope as Lee had intended after the three days of Bull Run. On August 31st, the plan was put into motion. Longstreet would stay where he was, his wing performing the same function as they did when Jackson found his way into the Federal rear. Stewart's cavalry would skirmish with Union forces, announcing the potential threat of the movement. Stirring into action, Pope would dispatch several units to meet this threat, including Sumner's Second Corps. Moving to a place called Ox Hill would be two brigades from Reno's division under Isaac Stevens, followed up by Kearney's division from Heintzelman's Corps. Joe Hooker had already established a defensive line at Germantown, which caused Stonewall's column to stop. Jackson's men were actually resting at Ox Hill, modern-day Chantilly, which is a little north of Centerville. In fact, Jackson was napping as Stewart's cavalry skirmished with the Yankees. On September 1st, Jackson would set up his wing to meet the oncoming Yankee threat. Stevens would be advancing toward the Little River Turnpike and make contact with the Confederates. The 79th New York would act as skirmishers, Stevens realizing he needed to push back the rebels if his line of retreat was to stay open. Stevens was reinforced by Ferrer's brigade under Reno, helping, but still being outnumbered. Ferrer's men are fresh off, having done good service at 2nd Manassas, his men being on Henry House Hill, which secured the federal retreat. Rain would fall as the assault from Stevens began, the Northerners moving against Stark's division. Despite initial success, the attack would falter when faced by the elements and the Confederate defenders. Parts of Hill's command would fill out the rebel line. Stevens would attempt to rally the 79th, grabbing the colors and urging them forward. It was while rallying the men in this way that a bullet would pierce his temple and kill him instantly. 
conducting a fierce counterattack, the 79th New York and 28th Massachusetts would suffer heavy casualties. The brigades under Stevens would then slowly withdraw. Phil Kearney would arrive on the field after these initial attacks were repulsed. Jackson would meanwhile throw reinforcements forward. Burney's brigade would move forward on the rebel right. Now, Kearney had been promised support during the assault on the Confederate position, but Reno had failed to give him any regiments. The 21st Massachusetts would emerge from the woods on the Union right, and the New Jersey general would urge them into place. Not satisfied with their advance, he would personally check their progress. Riding too far out in front of the Union troops, he would come under fire from the Confederates, and like Stevens, would be killed. Now there is some speculation that Kearney, despite being a very good officer, one of the better officers in the Army of the Potomac, actually loses his nerve at Chantilly, and he kind of wildly rides in front of his men. Now, it's hard to tell, we're never really going to know, but there are certain accounts that have that as being the case. The death of Kearney would mark the end of the Federal assaults and the battle. Amazingly, there were no general officers killed during Second Manassas, but at the Battle of Chantilly, two would fall from the Union side. 1,300 total casualties would be suffered by the Federals, with 800 more falling from Jackson's wing. Chantilly, or Ox Hill as it is sometimes called, was significant for several reasons. Despite the Confederate failure to accomplish their goal, the Union Army would not operate offensively in the near future. Because of this emphasis on more of a defensive posture, it would then open the availability to invade Maryland, which is exactly what Lee is going to do. Chantilly is also significant because it is now time to say goodbye to John Pope. It is fair to say that Pope was probably outclassed by Lee during the Northern Virginia Campaign of 1862. I would liken him to an offensive-minded football coach. But if the offense of the football team isn't good, and that's why you are brought on board in the first place, then ownership is going to seek a replacement. Lincoln is ownership in this scenario, and the aggressive nature of Pope, while not entirely devoid in the campaign, was definitely gone by the end of the battle at Ox Hill. It was plain that he was not going to be the commander that was necessary to win the war. Lincoln, though, had two problems. The first was that Pope was sort of an embarrassment to the administration. He was a Republican, and everyone knew he had strong political ties, so they really can't just fire him it would be necessary to have him bow out gracefully. What better opportunity for Pope to show his worth than to crush an uprising in Minnesota? So that is where John Pope heads, as we all very well know from our episode a couple of weeks ago. He will actually continue to serve out on the frontier and get a reputation as an Indian lover. This is actually very interesting, Of course, at the time, it seemed as negative, of course, but Pope doesn't really seem to care that during his time in Minnesota, he starts to develop more lenient policies when it comes to natives. And it's even more surprising given that, as we know from the Dakota Uprising episode, when he gets there, he really wants to kick into action and start executing people, right? But over time, that kind of resolve is going to change, so it is interesting to see from John Pope. Here is now the second problem, though. Lee, as mentioned, is going to move into Maryland. He has not done so just yet, but he will by September 4th. The turnaround time is very quick, from the end of the campaign to the beginning of the first invasion of the North. 
Lincoln, Halleck, and Stanton need someone to lead their now disorganized armies, but it cannot just be anyone. Any new commander would take time to acclimate to the new role. They would also most likely need to make some changes. Ambrose Burnside was actually offered a command of the army, but declined. Someone who was already familiar with command and had a knack for organization was already on hand, although I would venture to guess that both Lincoln and Halleck were not enjoying that potential conversation. George B. McClellan would receive the two at his home. On September 2nd, he would be renamed commander in the East and set about organizing the Army of the Potomac once again for a pursuit of the Confederates. So, we can see that Little Mac's dragging of his feet and then conveniently sticking around in Washington, it's going to ultimately pay off, at least for the time being. Robert E. Lee will march his army to Leesburg so that he could cross and move into Maryland. The Army of Northern Virginia would quickly occupy Frederick, which at that time was the second largest city in Maryland. The goal for Lee would be Hagerstown, and then a potential move into Pennsylvania. I think this is something that we don't necessarily realize, that this is actually the objective of the first invasion. Maryland, as we know, was a slave state, and thus there are certain amounts of Confederate sympathizers and supporters who are from Maryland or still live in Maryland. So if you are the Confederate Army and you're trying to conduct foraging operations, then it would make more sense to actually be in a state like Pennsylvania that does not have any of these ties. That's kind of why Lee wants to make it all the way up there and really changed the front of the war. Now Lee is actually not going to get there in 1862, but he will in 1863. Why exactly, though, was the invasion deemed necessary? If you remember, John Pope's army had been living off the land in northern Virginia, and that really had not been going very well. With the land picked clean, the Confederates would need to find greener pastures. So even though they have gained this ground, and even if John Pope's army withdraws back into Washington, it's going to be slim pickings where they are, so it is going to be necessary to move on. Jefferson Davis would be given the reasoning that there would be potential support in Maryland, but in reality, Lee doubted that there would be any new recruits swelling into his ranks. In fact, as we will soon come to mention, Lee is actually going to lose men as he invades the North. He's going to lose them to straggling, and then there are actually a certain amount of men who refuse to go into Maryland, and the reason being that they joined the army strictly for the purposes of defending the Confederate territory, so they see this move as a potential conquest of a northern state, and they don't agree with that. Now, the amount of soldiers who fall into that particular category are going to be not quite so many to really affect the army too awfully much, but as we're going to see here, especially at Antietam, Robert E. Lee is going to need every man he can get. Just to further emphasize the fact that there is probably not going to be too much support in Maryland for the Confederates, when the Union reoccupy Frederick, and they're going to do so pretty soon, they're actually met with cheering, whereas there is less of a warm reception for the Confederates when they initially march through. Regardless of the reasoning or how potentially successful the invasion was going to be, it may well have been a turning point in the war. Braxton Bragg and Kirby Smith would begin offensive operations in Kentucky. 
and Earl Van Dorn would be hitting northern Mississippi. This is probably the closest that the Confederates are going to come to a coordinated offensive action between the theaters. But if there were gains somewhere, then the tide would truly be turned. How different things were shaking up as opposed to the very beginning of the year, 1862. So, this is the plan from the Confederate perspective. We know the objective, but some things need to be solved before proceeding. Namely, there is a federal garrison at Martinsburg and Harper's Ferry. These troops would total some 12,000 men, and if Lee moves on Hagerstown, they are going to be in his rear. If he is able to remove these men, then mountain ranges would shield the Confederates from the Union armies around Washington. There would also be an open supply line to the Shenandoah Valley. So Lee will dispatch Longstreet to move on Hagerstown, while Jackson and divisions under McClaws and Walker would move on Harper's Ferry. Jackson is going to come from the north, and the other two from the south. D.H. Hill and his division would bring up the rear. All told, Lee would have some 70,000 men. This number is actually going to be greatly decreased by the amount of straggling, as we're going to see once again before we get to Antietam. Potentially, though, you might see a problem with this plan. It is dividing up the rebel forces. If the Union Army were to find out what the situation really was, then there could be disaster at the end of the invasion. But why exactly would McClellan know the plans of the Confederates? This would be because he happens to acquire a copy. Lee sent his orders outlining the troop movements in General Order 191 to all of his commanders. Jackson thought he needed to pass the orders on to D.H. Hill, who, if you remember, had been under his command during the seven days. Hill has two copies, but misplaces one. This copy would actually fall in the hands of the pursuing Union forces, something Lee did not count on, and may be surprising given who is at the helm. McClellan set off more rapidly in pursuit of the enemy. His army would split into wings, one under Burnside, one under Sumner, and a third under Franklin. When arriving at the former location of Hill's campsite, the Federals would come across the misplaced orders. Reportedly, they were wrapped around some cigars that were left in a field, and it is unclear whether the cigars were enjoyed by anyone afterward, but I like to think that they were a real happy ending. Little Mac could not believe his good fortune. While not informing of troop numbers, there was important information on the layout of the army. Longstreet and Hill were on the opposite side of South Mountain, part of the Blue Ridge Mountain Range. Knowing that Jackson was not with Lee, McClellan would push his troops to make contact with the Confederates there. This would spark the Battle of South Mountain. South Mountain was a fairly large-sized battle that is important to the lead-up for Antietam. Unfortunately, when compared to the highest amount of loss on a single day in American history, it is often overlooked. On September 14th, D.H. Hill had his men strung out trying to protect the approaches of several gaps in the mountain. There were men stationed at Turner's Gap and Fox's Gap a little to the south. Crampton's Gap lay even further to the south, very close to the troops under McClaws, who were besieging Harper's Ferry. It was this body of troops that made retreat to a different line not an option. 
Longstreet would actually advise Lee that they should fall back to a place called Sharpsburg and make a new line along Antietam Creek. But this would sacrifice the division under McClaws and could allow the garrison at Harper's Ferry to escape. All not good things for Robert E. Lee. No, they would have to stand and fight. Stuart had already begun skirmishing with the enemy on September 13th and had requested support from Hill's infantry brigades. Jacob Cox would lead his Kanad division, leading the 9th Corps, which was under Jesse Reno. Cox would actually run into an officer who had been captured during the skirmishing and paroled, making his way back to Union lines. When told of the destination of the two brigades under Cox to be Turner's Gap, the officer would exclaim, My God, be careful. This, of course, is a violation of the parole, but also probably not what you want to hear as you're leading your men into battle. There could be a strike at the more southerly Fox's Gap, though. Reno would potentially bring up the remainder of his corps. Hooker, too, would send his men north to Turner's Gap, bringing large numbers down on Hill, who would soon be sending for help from Longstreet at nearby Hagerstown. Samuel Garland would command a brigade at Fox's Gap. Garland was a 31-year-old Virginia native who had graduated from VMI and the law school at the University of Virginia. Despite his age, Garland had already displayed his ability to command and courage during the seven days, actually being wounded in the elbow. His brigade of North Carolina troops were mostly veterans, but were also bolstered by conscriptions. His men would start to engage the lead elements of Cox's troops. This would include an assault by the 23rd Ohio, commanded by Rutherford B. Hayes. Hayes would actually be wounded in the assault and almost abandoned by his men, although he was recovered. Stubbornly, the Confederate troops would resist, with sharp fighting erupting by a homestead called the Wise Cabin. Garland also had artillery support, which would fend off Cox for some time. A bullet, though, would find Garland in the chest during the rifle exchanges, resulting in his death soon thereafter. Command would fall to Duncan McRae, who was sent two additional regiments as reinforcements. In the shuffling of his line, there became a gap that was exploited by the Ohio regiments, charging with hand-to-hand -hand fighting occurring in some places. One of these assaulting regiments reportedly laid down to avoid a volley from the North Carolina troops. The 13th North Carolina would countercharge, saving the remainder of the Confederate forces, but the Federals were still in possession of the gap. Cox would not press the advantage, but rather wait for reinforcements. Reinforcements were on the way from both sides. Longstreet was marching neighbor Jones's division from Hagerstown. John Bell Hood's division would arrive just in time to split between Fox's and Turner's Gap. In the meantime, Thomas Drayton would advance his brigade toward Cox's Federals. Roswell Ripley was organizing his men for a counterattack ordered by D.H. Hill. Ripley, though, would not get his men together in time, leaving Drayton to face an entire division under Orlando Wilcox. Wilcox had been taken prisoner at First Manassas and spent some time in Libby Prison before being exchanged. He would command the former troops under Isaac Stevens, including the 28th Massachusetts, 79th New York, and 100th Pennsylvania Roundheads. Also included was a brand new regiment, the 17th Michigan, who would see their first action on the day and perform well. One of the things that McClellan does well, especially with these new regiments, is that he places them with veteran units. So we have already 
talked a couple times about the 28th Massachusetts and the 79th New York, where they're going to get sprinkled in with these newer regiments. Drayton would meet Wilcox's two brigades and engage in fierce fighting that would see his brigade decimated, losing about 50% of their number. A brief attack and attempt to capture a battery would relatively end the fight at Fox's Gap. Jesse Reno would ride forward and receive a volley from Hood's men who were moving down the mountain toward the Federal position. A shot would hit Reno in the chest, which would prove mortal. Reno was still able to tell his friend, General Samuel Sturgis, that the wound had did him in before expiring. Reno was well liked by his men, and unfortunately, he was hit as the action in that sector was almost over. At Turner's Gap, Hooker's men under Meade would begin an assault. Rufus King's men would be in command again by John Hatch. They would also attack with Ricketts's being the reserve division. Meade's division would meet Robert Rhodes and his single brigade outnumbered some 1,800 to 4,000. Rhodes and his Alabama regiments would hold off Meade for a time, but eventually be forced to withdraw. Truman Seymour's men would lead the attack for the Pennsylvanians, led by the 13th Bucktails. Seymour, who we have mentioned several times but not introduced, will go on to become an accomplished painter after the war. Hatch's division would then push back brigades under James Kemper and Robert Garnett, who had formed on the right of Rhodes. Garnett, you recall, was back to field command after having been relieved by Jackson following Kernstown. His men would fight well but be pressured too heavily by the men under Marcena Patrick, Doubleday, and Walter Phelps. Phelps would command New York regiments, dubbed the Iron Brigade. Speaking of the eventual most famous Iron Brigade, John Gibbon would assault Alfred Colquitt's men a little further south and be repulsed, suffering the highest percentage of casualties for a brigade during the battle and not dislodging the defenders as had been done in other locations. Still, their bravery under fire this action at South Mountain would actually prove to solidify the name Iron Brigade for the Midwestern regiments. Now, Crampton's Gap, the further south, was an interesting case. William Franklin and the Sixth Corps were tasked with taking the Gap and perhaps blowing up Lee's entire plan. From that location, they could find themselves in the rear of Lafayette McClaws and perhaps lift the siege of Harper's Ferry. In fact, McClellan would wish this of Franklin if that was possible. Obviously, though, as we're going to see, there is something to be desired in the sense of urgency that McClellan is going to give his subordinate Franklin. It's one of the main criticisms of McClellan. He has the plans for Lee's army, and there's a little bit of a lackadaisical nature in terms of how he goes about actually attacking Lee. So even though he doesn't like to attack, he has the plans that Lee has, and he understands, if not the strength, at least the troop dispositions, there's still going to be a certain amount of failure here, as we're going to see. Defending Crampton's Gap was just one brigade of Confederates under Paul Sims, as well as Munford's cavalry. Sims would immediately send for reinforcements from McClaws, who would respond by in turn sending Hal Cobb and his men. Cobb had served as Speaker of the House during the Buchanan administration. His orders were to hold off the Federals or lose his command in the process. It would still be a little over 2,000 men against the entire Sixth Corps, not good odds for the Rebels. Franklin would designate Joseph Bartlett of Slocum's division to lead the assault. Slocum would be followed up by Balty Smith, 
whose brigades included the Vermont regiments we talked about during the siege of Yorktown, as well as a brigade under Winfield Scott Hancock. Bartlett's assault would see the Confederate line, minus the not-yet-arrived Cobb, face his brigade as well as two others, including one under John Newton and the New Jersey Brigade. Newton was an engineer who was actually native to Norfolk, Virginia. His own cousin would be on the other side of the field from him on September 14th. The New Jersey regiments were spoiling for a fight after their heavy loss just before 2nd Manassas that included their brigade commander, and then the additional loss of Kearney at Chantilly just days before. After a brief firefight, they would lead the assault up Crampton's Gap, supported by the other brigades, and dislodge the rebel line. Cobb would form his line just as the first was breaking. But his men would not last long, being swept away by the oncoming Yankees. Darkness would save McClaws, who had been informed that there was possibly a single brigade attacking his men at Crampton's Gap. Still, the Union Army was in possession of the field. They had won a key victory at the cost of 2,325 casualties compared to 2,685 Confederates. Now, I'm going to hold off until next week to get into the significance of the battle, but I do want to mention one other event before calling it quits. Harper's Ferry, which had begun to be besieged on the 12th, would surrender on the 15th of September. A siege, though, had not been part of the plan. Lee thought that the garrison would leave and withdraw north, which is why he sent Jackson on a northerly route so he could capture the 12,000 men. Instead, the Union troops would be holed up in the Virginia City. Harper's Ferry has high ground that surrounds it, Maryland Heights, Bolivar Heights, and Loudoun Heights being the main high ground. As long as it can defend the high ground, then everything is fine. For the Union, though, most of the troops are untrained recent recruits. On the 13th, Maryland Heights is scheduled for an assault by Kershaw and Barksdale, but the terrain is rough, and there are good earthworks with Abatee. The Union troops here are commanded by Colonel Thomas Ford of the 32nd Ohio. Ford will afterward be dismissed from the Army. So, you can probably tell how it goes for Thomas Ford here at Harper's Ferry. Ford's men would actually repulse the Confederate attack with heavy casualties inflicted for being rookie troops. But, for unknown reasons, they would then withdraw from Maryland Heights. Dixon Miles, who is commanding the garrison at Harper's Ferry, to his credit, had ordered Colonel Ford to stay where he was. Maryland Heights is the highest of these mountains and is captured by Jackson, who was also able to move artillery onto a position called Schoolhouse Ridge. Bolivar and Maryland Heights would be able to bring artillery to bear on the Union troops. There would be another defensive line set up by Miles that could potentially repulse the rebels, but A.P. Hill is able to flank the Union line with a night assault. By the 14th, Jackson had some 50 guns ready to pound the city into submission. Dixon Miles, who commanded the reserve in McDowell's army, if you remember, was contemplating surrender. He would raise the white flag to give up his 12,000 men on the 15th. At this time, a shell would strike near him and shatter his leg, a wound that would prove to be fatal. Now, there are some theories out there that this was a early form of fragging an officer, given his often drunken behavior, but that has not been proven. Jackson had captured the entire 12,000-man force at Harper's Ferry at the cost of 286 casualties of his own. 
Once again, Jackson's men would benefit from captured federal supplies. 73 pieces of artillery were seized as a result. Remember that Harper's Ferry does have an arsenal, so that's why it is also very important. The 12,000 men would be the largest surrender for the Federals during the war. A.P. Hill would be left at Harper's Ferry to parole the enemy while Jackson hurried to join Lee at a place near Antietam Creek. This, of course, is going to have some significance that you're going to have to find out next episode. So with that, we have a good setup for the battle outside Sharpsburg. We have had yet another eventful episode, so I want to pause there and pick up immediately prior to the battle next week, where we will have another long episode covering the Battle of Antietam in its entirety, and hopefully discussing further exactly why it was so important. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.